we welcome back everyone for our third and final session of the day and welcome back everyone online and thank you for staying with us um, throughout the day we've got um, what is sure to finish off the day in style session on workshop management um, which will take us through to about half past five um, three speakers again in this session and um, our first speaker is Linda Walk Simon um, Linda is adjunct professor at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, where she teaches courses on curatorial practice, Italian Renaissance and Baroque art, and old master drawings. She was a longtime curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and subsequently head of drawings and prints and founding director of the Drawing Institute at the Morgan Library. Most recently, she was director and chief curator of the Fairfield University Art Museum. She's organised exhibitions, lectured and published extensively on Raphael and his workshop, especially Giulio Romano and Perina del Vaga, on 16th century Florentine art and on Italian old master drawings. Her publication, Raphael at the Metropolitan, the Colonna Altarpiece, was awarded a prize for excellence by the Association of Museum Curators. So please well, uh, join me in welcoming Linda to the podium for her talk today, Quelli Garzoni di Raphael da Urbino, some observations on Raphael's workshop. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this wonderful conference for the invitation to speak to you all today. The phrase, Quelli Garzoni di Raffaello da Rubino, occurs in a letter that Federico Gonzaga wrote to Baltasare Castiglione in December 1521. Federico was trying to persuade Giulia Romano and Gian Francesco Pegni, the Garzoni in question, to come to work for him in Mantua and had enlisted Castiglione in his lobbying campaign. The letter shows that more than a year and a half after Raphael's death, his two principal assistants were still referred to as his Garzoni. Their names are not mentioned here or in much of the related correspondence. Moreover, they were undifferentiated and conjoined. Federico wasn't interested in Giulio and Penny as individuals or individually, rather he was courting them as a single unit. Their appeal was their lineage. The Garzoni of Raphael were the next best thing to the revered dead master himself. Giulio and Penny were the most prominent members of a larger monolith, the workshop, as the core of assistants Raphael began to assemble after 1512 was always designated. Before they were in place, he relied on established independent artists like Lorenzo Lotto and Timoteo Vitti as temporary collaborators. Keeping pace with the ever more crushing demands he labored under, the workshop's population expanded around 1515-1516 with the addition of Giovanni da Udine, Lorenzetto, and Perino del Vaga, and it was further augmented in Raphael's busiest last years by new recruits, among them Polidoro da Caravaggio. And we see the workshop in this group portrait by Giovanni da Udine at work on the decorations of the Vatican Loge, or at least in the Vatican Loge, their greatest collaborative project. In discussions of Raphael's practice, the workshop nomenclature is used liberally and fluidly, both to signify this population of Garzoni and to indicate the presence of hands other than the masters in drawings, paintings, and frescoes, even if there's often disagreement in this dead-end attributional quagmire about just whose hands those might be. Applying the term to Raphael's operation in Rome implies that established conventions governing workshop practice in artistic centers like Florence were in place, although this is supposition rather than demonstrable fact. No one would disagree that a hierarchical constellation of personnel, an organizing principle of the Renaissance workshop, was at the core of Raphael's enterprise in Rome. What's not acknowledged is how obfuscating the prepackaged workshop construct is for describing his exceptional operation, given how little is actually known about its internal structure and its day-to-day -day functioning. Flawed assumptions persist, and interrogations that might necessitate revised thinking are elided. As a prelude to a larger study, my talk today will offer some new pieces of information about most of the principal members of Raphael's workshop that together begin to lay the foundation for a synthetic biography of the workshop as a whole. And spoiler alert, an alternative subtitle to my talk could have been A Iloro Papa, 
Rothwell's boys and their dads. <laughs> John Francesco Pagny was probably Raphael's first permanent assistant. From early on, he was known by the puzzling moniker Il Fattore, which is best translated according to 16th century uses as agent. John Sherman posited that Penny had an administrative role in the workshop, facilitating the implementation of what Betty Talvacchia characterized as Raphael's managerial style. But this may be a nickname looking for an accounting rather than a reality that explains the nickname. Documents from Paney's lifetime use variants, one being factore, which has a meaning closer to the Latin factorum or English factotum, literally a maker, but more broadly, an employee who does all kinds of work. If Paney was Raphael's first garzoni before a proper workshop was constituted, he may well have been a factore and I'm deliberately avoiding here and throughout the term apprentice. Penny was Florentine. This has always been known, but little's been made of it. However, there's no record of him having been trained in Florence and he didn't matriculate in the Florentine Painters Guild. So either he left Florence before becoming an apprentice in a painter's studio, which typically occurred around age 11 or 12 and sometimes younger, or he wasn't originally on a career track to become an artist. The year of Penny's birth was long a mystery. Conjectured dates in the literature range from 1488 to 1496. So his age at the time he joined Raphael can only be guessed at. However, his baptismal record, published by Anna Bishagi, establishes that Penny was born in March 1494. So if he came with Raphael from Florence to Rome in 1508, perhaps after his stint in his household, and this is an old idea in the literature, he would have been about 14. Such a scenario could explain why Penny had no documented formal training or independent career in his native city and how he came to be part of Raphael's circle in Rome. According to Milanese in his annotated edition of Vasari, Penny was the son of a Florentine weaver, no surname, Michele di Luca di Bartolomeo. But both the paternal name and the profession are wrong. The baptismal record establishes that his father was named Battista di Jacopo Pini, and other documents record unequivocally that this Battista Pini, John Francesco's father, was a physician, a medico or physico. If he practiced his profession in Florence, Battista Pini would have matriculated in the Guild of Medici Speciale, to which painters also belonged. Battista Pini is probably I believe, one and the same with the Florentine medico Giovanni Giacomo Pini, who was present in Rome by 1513 when he wrote an account of the latter in possesso of the newly elected Pope Leo X. His other claim to fame, such as it was, was his authorship of a pamphlet describing the rhinoceros King Manuel of Portugal sent as a gift to the Pope. Intended as a companion to Leo's beloved elephant Anno, it died in transit before reaching Rome. This modest publication establishes that Penny Pear was still alive and still in Rome at this time. It also demonstrates that he wasn't much of a poet. The author himself acknowledged as much with a self-deprecating confession. Some will say these casual verses have been done without any genius and that I insult the great muses by my ineptitude. Given the Florentine connection and his presence at the 1513 letter in Possesso, we might wonder, in fact, if Battista, Giovanni Battista, Pini was a member of Leo X's extended household, which attracted swarms of Florentine arrivists, men of talent and ability, but also opportunists, sycophants, fortune seekers, and general hangers on. These circumstances eliminate a possible alternative route for Pini's arrival in Rome that he came with his father at an unknown date and first encountered Raphael in the milieu of the papal court rather than in Florence. Penny was in any event recorded as living on his own in Rome by 1518, the antecrem no doubt for the death of his father, who a contract makes clear was deceased by the year 1520. And although I can't elaborate here, I don't believe that Luca Penny was John Francesco's brother, contrary to Vasari's garbled claim. And there's Penny supposedly um, posed for a drawing by Julia for 
one of the figures in the Sala di Costantino, right on the left crop to show how he would have looked without the exaggerated beard. Lorenzetto joined Raphael's workshop in 1515 or 1516. He was a sculptor and an architect, and for a career that lasted over 25 years, his known output is modest. The sculptures produced by him during the five years of his association with Raphael can almost be counted on one hand. And you see a list on the screen, and here a montage of those works. Mazzari reports that Raphael loved Lorenzetto like a son. This was demonstrable, demonstrable reality, not just a trope. According to Castiglione, Raphael, playing matchmaker, had actively promoted Lorenzetto's marriage to the sister of Giulia Romano, his favorite disciple, who he also loves like a son. But affection is not sufficient for explaining Lorenzetto's utility in the workshop. What was he doing, and why did Raphael hold him in such high esteem? Like Penny, Lorenzetto was a Florentine. According to his Bet Chisel record, discovered not long ago, he was born in 1490, not 1493, as was usually assumed. His beginnings in Florence are obscure and undocumented, but he must have trained with his father, Ludovico Lotti, a goldsmith and bronze caster who made bells and candelabra for Florence Cathedral and became master founder of canon for the Florentine Republic. Ludovico Lotti was on the committee convened to decide on the placement of Michelangelo's David, a reflection of his standing in Florence. And the committee also included the fathers of Bandinelli, who was a prominent goldsmith, and Cellini, a fife player. And finally, Ludovico worked briefly with Michelangelo on the lost bronze sculpture of Julius II, presumably in the capacity as expert bronze caster, but they parted company before the work was um, completed under less than amicable terms. He died in 1519. Lorenzetto was without doubt in Florence in 1514 when he was working on Verrocchio's unfinished Forte Guerri monument. The last recorded payment for that is June of 1514 and probably still there in 1515 if I'm right to conjecture that a document that would prove this refers to him, never connected with him before. But he must have left Rome not long after arriving at the end of that year or early, uh, or early in 1516 at the latest when he collaborated on the Stufacta of Cardinal Bidena in the Vatican. He did this relief and another one on the opposite wall. Overlaying Lorenzetto's skeletal early biography with Raphael's chronology allows for some inferences about the sculptor's role in the workshop. Sculpture had not been a part of Raphael's earliest Roman commissions. His first major project integrating sculpture was the Chigi Chapel in Santa Maria della Pace, begun in 1510. Two bronze tondi based on Raphael's designs have been connected with this commission. For their production, Raphael had to outboard work to a goldsmith, probably Cesarino Rossetti. These reliefs were long attributed to Lorenzetto, an idea that can be definitively dismissed if for no other reason than he was still in Florence when the project was underway. Tom Henry has observed that the two reliefs were not brought up to the same level of finish. And also, seeing them in the recent Raphael show, it was perfectly evident that both show weaknesses in the translation of Raphael's design into bronze, uh, particularly the descent into limbo, which shows notable casting flaws. For unknown reasons, the reliefs were never installed, perhaps because of the problems that self-evidently plagued their protracted production. This is the challenge that may have convinced Raphael of the benefits of working with a sculptor rather than a goldsmith for bronze sculpture of this scale and complexity, particularly with the more ambitious and multimedia Kiji Chapel and Santa Maria del Popolo looming. And ideally, a sculptor trained in bronze casting. Designing bronze sculpture is one thing, knowing how to cast it is quite another. Whether or not this was the catalyst, within a few years, Raphael had brought Lorenzetto, a dedicated specialist, into his workshop. The fact that he not only possessed the requisite and rare skill set that allowed him to design as well as cast bronze sculpture, but was also a capable mar marble carver, made him uniquely suited to the moment. Lorenzetto was also knowledgeable ant about antiquities, and he was a skilled restorer. Mm. 
Yeah, because it's frozen. Wait. There, yeah, great. Sorry. So he was very knowledgeable about antiquities and he was a skilled restorer. There's some thought that the Madonna del Sasso on the left, um, which is, is uh, on Raphael's tomb, was carved from an ancient sculpture. And I wonder if the Kiji Chapel Jonah on the right incorporates some antique fragments. Raphael must have been keenly interested in this particular expertise on the part of his new Gertzoni since their affiliation began not long after Leo X appointed him Prefect of Antiquities in August of 1515. So to answer the rhetorically posed question, Lorenzetto's utility was considerable and on multiple fronts as Raphael expanded the capabilities and reach of his operation and moved into new areas of production after 1515. This he did by adding specialists, Lorenzetto, Giovanni da Udine, and earlier Marcantonio Raimondi to the ranks. Carino del Vaga's beginnings are less obscure than his compagni, and in what now emerges as a pattern, Perino was a Florentine. Born in 1501, he was younger than any of Raphael's other principal assistants, and he was an orphan, so his father doesn't figure into his backstory, though Perino too loved Raphael like a son. Precisely when he arrived in Rome is undocumented, but it was in late 1515 or 1516, meaning that he came at the same time and from the same place as Lorenzetto. Their parallel trajectories can't be a coincidence, and in fact, the document I propose to associate with Lorenzetto establishes that he and Perino were working on the same project for the Florentine Entrata of Leo X in November 1515. <laughs> There's some thought that Raphael himself may have been in Florence for the Pope's ceremonial visit. If that's the case, he obviously used the occasion to recruit new talent. It's a reasonable surmise, I think, that Perino was recommended by his master Ridolfo Ghirlandaio, Raphael's old friend in Florence. In considering how Raphael's workshop functioned, it's of note that even though he was quite young, the precocious Perino was already trained when he joined. Raphael did not need to teach him the rudiments of drawing and painting. For purposes of the arguments I'm putting forth, the key point is that even though he was of an appropriate age to be an apprentice in the conventional contractual mode, he wasn't. <laughs> Just to show you one of the first works projects he collaborated on upon arriving, very damaged and hard to see object of Cardinal Bugena, and then here, a splendid ceiling he did together with Giovanni de Udine um, in the Vatican on floor below the Saudi Costantino, I believe while Raphael was still alive. Perino is often paired with Poeta de Caravaggio in discussions of Raphael's workshop. They're believed to have been roughly the same age and of comparable standing, newer arrivals than Giulio and Penny, but still part of the core workshop organization. A few of the assumptions about Polidoro bear revisiting. It's thought that he was born around 1499 or 1500, but that was just a guess, and it may be wrong. If the maestro Polidoro Pintor, referred to in a document of 1517, is Polidoro Caravaggio, it's probable that he was born some years earlier. The designation Maestro indicates that this painter named Polidoro was already an established master and had therefore attained a certain age, presumably at least 25, the age of male adulthood in Rome. Moreover, an 18th century account that has to be given some weight states that Polidoro was born in 1490, a full decade earlier than the presumed birth date put forth in the literature. And this has been discussed by David Franklin. And last, if the bearded man wearing a scufiotto, this kind of hairnet under a hat, which was the height of male fashion in the 1520s, if this bearded man and these two presumed self-portrait drawings by Polidoro, which were almost certainly done in Rome before the sack, appears too old to be in his late teens or 20s, I mean, I think he does, he persuades as someone in his 30s. It's impossible to state with certainty that the documented Maestro Polidoro Pintor referenced in the 1517 document is indeed Polidoro de Caravaggio, but in the absence of a more compelling candidate, in fact of any other candidates, and the suggestive testimony that he was quite possibly of an age to fit the description, this becomes, I think, a viable possibility. So Polidoro de Caravaggio, excuse me, may have been an established painter, not Vasari's ambitious young floor sweeper when he joined Raphael's operation. 
This alternative narrative finds support not just in the document I mentioned, but also in unpublished drawing that relates to the Vatican loge. The drawing, in my opinion, is by Polidoro, and it's a study for the corresponding fresco, which he executed, not a copy after it. Polidoro here may have elaborated a schematic design that originated with Raphael. This was the evolution of the David and Goliath scene. The quick sketch of the principal figures by Raphael on the left was likely worked up by the fresco's executive, in this case Perino, into the multi-figure final composition. And interestingly, he obviously reversed the two principal figures. This composition drawing by Perino for another scene, a rare surviving example of its type, elucidates the process. It's fully worked up, and the author of this is certainly Perino. And here's the corresponding fresco. And this drawing, by the way, is close as close as Perino ever gets to Raphael's manner as a draftsman. There are no attribution questions attached to him. Surprisingly, given that he was Raphael's closest disciple, Giulio Romano's early biography is even more full of holes than Penny's and Lorenzetto's. His birth date is disputed, his family background is obscure, and when and under what circumstances he entered Raphael's workshop is a, a mystery. Vasari, who knew Giulio personally, is unhelpful. His vita contains no biographical background and offers only a perfunctory and generic preamble before moving on to the erroneous claim that Giulio's first work for Raphael was the Vatican Loge. The black hole is baffling, and to compensate for it, made-up scenarios have been invented. One has Giulio's father escorting him to Raphael's studio at the age of 11 or 12 to begin an apprenticeship. A bald paraphrase of Vasari's account of Raphael's father, Giovanni Santi, escorting him to Perugino's studio to begin his apprenticeship, also a made-up scenario. While this manufactured plot adheres to the template for apprenticeships in painter studios in Florence, there's nothing in the contemporary record to indicate that such were Giulio's beginnings. Nor, for that matter, is there any evidence that Raphael even had apprentices in the conventional sense the legally binding contractual arrangements that governed artistic training in Florence and elsewhere. So this is in any case the wrong model to invoke. The standard master pupil pedagogical dynamic was not in play in Raphael's workshop. With precious little time to teach, no need to supplement his income by taking on pupils and a crushing workload to carry out, Raphael's practice was to employ artists, not to train them. Once again, the birthday question is critical, and this is the key for determining Giulio's age when he entered Raphael's workshop. If he was born in 1499, as many scholars believe, he would have been about 12 at the time. However, there's a strong likelihood that the birth date given by Vasari, 1492, even though less favored in scholarship, is correct. Evidence for this exists in the language used in a contract in a document of 1520, which makes clear that Giulio was at that time at least 25 years old. This means he was 20 if he entered Raphael's workshop around 1512, the earliest possible moment, and as old as 24 if the affiliation began around 1516, as is often contended. Age 20, let alone age 24, was simply too old to begin to learn the rudiments. Julia must have been doing something else before he came to work with Raphael, not as a boy, but as a young man like Lorenzetto and perhaps Polidoro. What this was awaits future investigation. For now, I would just point out the evidence is mounting that Raphael's Garzoni were not, chronologically speaking, boys at all. Julia's father, Pietro Pipi, who's coming into focus as a personality, and who I believe on the basis of different bits of evidence had an independent relationship with Raphael. His father, Pietro Pepe, is a big part of this emerging story, and I've written about this extensively. Until now, Pietro Pepe's profession was unknown, but unpublished documents found by Matteo Mazzalupi and kindly shared with me established that Pietro Pepe was an apothecary. Giulio's maternal uncle and half-brother practiced the same trade, so this must have been the family business. In addition to dispensing perfumes and medicines, apothecaries were purveyors of artist pigments. Some of those very materials, in fact, are listed in the 1524 inventory of Giulio's possessions. 
So perhaps Raphael and Pietro Pipi first encountered one another in this connection through business. Did Raphael meet Pietro Pipi through Giulio or was an acquaintance with his father the connection that paved the way for Giulio's introduction to Raphael? Only the discovery of new documents will clarify the nexus of relationships at the substructure of Raphael's workshop. I would end by returning to Federico Gonzaga's letter and finding in it a model to be heeded. Quoting Quali Garzoni di Raphael, he was not overly concerned with who was who, with matters of attribution and the division of hands. As other more interesting and fruitful lines of inquiry about Raphael's workshop surface, I would suggest that neither should we. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Linda. Problems of nomenclature is certainly something I've come across in my research, and um, I'm sure our audience will have lots of questions for you. Uh, so next today we have Aoife Brady. Aoife's curator of Italian and Spanish art at the National Gallery of Ireland. A specialist in Bolognese painting, Aoife has held curatorial roles with the National Gallery in London and the Paintings Department of the Getty. In addition, Aoife sits on the Old Masters Betting Committee for Tefaf Maastricht. Her primary research interests relate to the study of painting techniques, materials and artist studio practices with focus on 17th century Italy and Spain. Aoife's curatorial projects have included an exhibition of Bartolomé Esteban Murillo's series of paintings depicting the parable of the prodigal son. More recently, she has curated a large scale monographic exhibition examining the life and work of Lavinia Fontana, which is at the National Gallery of Ireland uh, from May to August this year. Aoife's talk today is entitled Lavinia Fontana, Workshop Management as a Woman Artist. Thank you, Aoife. Thank you, Lois, and thank you all for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to speak to you. It's nice to come up for air after an exhibition and uh, share the research more widely. So Lavinia, uh, born in Bologna in 1552, Lavinia Fontana is recognised as the first woman to achieve professional success as a painter in the Western world. Operating beyond the confines of a court or a convent, Fontana's success was obtained in the face of considerable adversity. In 16th century Italy, women were frequently denied acceptance into important academies and guilds, precluded from training as an apprentice in an unrelated artist's studio, and for the most part, they were not permitted to represent themselves in business negotiations. It would probably be helpful if I had my own PowerPoint up, although Linda's was really rather elegant. No, bear with me. Am I going the wrong way? No. Here we are. So despite the many, many hindrances, Fontana maintained an impressively active career while also assuming the role of a wife and a mother. Having rejected genres traditionally deemed appropriate for female artists, such as flower painting, Fontana is believed to have been the first woman to execute large scale public altar pieces and mythological nudes. She was awarded many illustrious commissions and coveted honours over the course of her lifetime, and biographer Carlo Cesare Malvasia claims that Fontana's fees equaled or exceeded those of renowned court painters of the time, such as Anthony van Dyck. Perhaps preeminent among her long list of achievements and most important in this context is the fact that Lavinia Fontana is the first documented woman painter to have managed her own workshop. So this paper will offer an overview of the artist's working methods, identifying areas in which her day-to-day -day practice and the manner in which her workshop operated might have deviated from that of her male contemporaries, as well as the practical challenges that she fa faced as a consequence of her gender. Preparation was key in positioning Lavinia Fontana to become a commercially successful painter and to manage her own studio. Her initial access to this traditionally male dominated sphere came via her father, Prospero Fontana, of course, a successful artist in his own right. It seems that Prospero began to train his daughter relatively late in life, in the last years of her teens or in her early 20s, in response to his own failing health and concerns over his family's financial future. It was in her family home that Lavinia began her career, a house on the Via Galliera, which Prospero extended and converted into a grand studio that also functioned as a place of learning for his apprentices. 
Fontana's 1577 self-portrait depicts the artist sitting at a virginal and behind her we see a door into a workspace where two small canvases appear perched on an easel. Painted around seven years after she began her training, this may be the artist's early workspace. We can presume that as Fontana's career progressed, the scale and quantity of the works that she produced required her to work in a larger studio than that depicted here. And it's likely that what we see in the background of this painting is just one of a suite of rooms used by Prospero. Many Bolognese studios were comprised of a series of adjoining rooms in the upper stories of Bologna's arcaded streets, like those we saw just now. So we can presume that as Lavinia's career progressed, she was afforded access to more space. <clears throat> Lavinia's preparations required more than just an education. So unlike her male counterparts, in order to negotiate freely with clients and to manage business matters as a woman artist, she needed a husband. In 1577, following a search that lasted around two years, a suitable suitor was found and Lavinia was married to Gian Paolo Zappi of nearby Imola, a man described as of good social standing, but with little potential for earning. So ideal in this situation. Their marriage contract stipulated quite unusually that Lavinia would continue to practice as a painter after their wedding, rather than withdraw to a domestic role as would have been traditionally expected. And through this rather forward thinking arrangement, the young artist was facilitated in pursuing her professional career. Fontana began to create paintings independently in the 1570s. Her earliest clients were those scholarly men of Bologna's ancient university, a group that she gained access to, to through her father, who spent periods of his own career illustrating their publications. Lavinia sold many of these early portraits at a low price or gave them away as gifts, a strategy intended to establish her reputation and one that by all accounts was successful. By the 1580s, Lavinia was recognised as a celebrity artist in Bologna and beyond. And at this point, her ageing father seems to take a step back and she becomes the breadwinner of the family, running the studio independently, albeit with Prospero's continued looming presence, who continued to live with her and, man and manage the household's finances. Sometime before October 1588, the family moved home and studio across the city to the trenda, trendy Via della Fondazza, a street that links Stanza Stefano and Strada Maggiore, where most of Bologna's noble families lived in palaces. This created a central hub for the artist where she could interact with existing and potential clients quite easily. She marketed herself astutely to these noble clientele, the bulk of whom were the wives and daughters of the city's 40 ruling senatorial families, the Quaranta. She named daughters after some and had others stand as godparents to, to, to her children. And those godparents included the woman depicted here on the right, Ladomia Gozzadini, who Fontana's eldest daughter was named after. According to Malvasia, Fontana's strategy really worked and flocks of women began to descend on Lavinia in the city's streets, all of whom, according to the biographer, wished for nothing more than to be portrayed by her. <coughs> Around 150 paintings can be securely attributed to Lavinia Fontana today, created over the course of a career that spanned about 40 years. Her oeuvre is likely much larger in reality, as many works have been lost, destroyed, or are perhaps still unknown to us. And though, she's not, she, though she was not pr as prolific as some of her male contemporaries, many of her surviving paintings are highly detailed or executed on a very large scale, so we may assume that she managed a busy studio. The question of how Lavinia might have employed studio assistance in the production of her paintings is a difficult one to answer. Early modern writers, who were for the most part entirely preoccupied with the fact that Lavinia was a woman, uh, offer little to no information in this regard. And while Fontana's output would, at, ha would, at, would at times have warranted support, and of course her contemporaries in Bologna all employed artists in this way, it's quite likely that Lavinia's gender would have precluded her from having a regular team of male assistants painting shoulder to shoulder with her in the studio. And of course, there were no suitably qualified women in Bologna for her to employ. Lavinia could, however, have contracted artists to work on specific, specific commissions as required, perhaps making arrangements for them to execute their duties in separate spaces or at times when she was not present. And it is likely to have 
she's likely to have called on her father's former collaborators for such purposes. Indeed, other Bolognese artists actually favoured such an arrangement. Guido Rainey worked in a private room in his studio suite, arranging assistants in separate spaces according to hierarchy. There's some evidence to suggest that Lavinia's workshop also fun functioned as a place of learning. According to author physician Giulio Mancini, one of Lavinia's daughters, Ledomia, showed great promise in painting prior to her premature death at age 14, suggesting that as a young girl she studied with her mother. Fontana also seems to have been invo involved in teaching other students, so church records of San Giovanni in Monte di in Bologna refer to a painting that's today lost by a young girl of the Gozzadini family who was described as one of Lavinia Fontana's pupils. Fontana's husband, Gian Paolo Zappi, is reported to have been her key collaborator, though his role within the Fontana workshop is not entirely clear. According to Malvasia, he had trained for a period in Prospero Fontana's workshop and later assisted Lavinia in the execution of her paintings. The notion of an, a woman directing a studio was at this time entirely unprecedented, making the idea of a man acting as an assistant to his wife even more extraordinary. And the unusual nature of this reported arrangement was not lost on early modern writers, some of whom found it rather entertaining. In a comment seemingly meant to ridicule or emasculate Zappi, Malvasia claims that his artistic skills were weak and as such Fontana would only allow him to assist in painting draperies. Malvasia goes on to say that Zappi was content, therefore, to be a mere tailor because the heavens didn't want him to be a painter. And this joke seems to have been widespread in late 16th century Bologna. Oh, excuse me. That being said, the notion that Fontana farmed out the painting of draperies to her husband must be fallacy when we consider how central the detailed depiction of ornate textiles was to her portraits and how complex many of these textiles were in their construction. In fact, whether Zappi practiced as an artist at all is questionable. No mentions of artistic skill or prior training with Prospero are made in letters dating to 1577 between Severo Zappi, Gian Paolo's father, and his wife as they prepared for the arranged marriage between their son and Lavinia. While scholar Caroline Murphy suggests that while Gian Paolo may have shown an interest in painting, he spent his premarital years, and I quote, at his father's house without doing anything in particular. Unlike Malvasia, whose Felsina Patrice was published almost a century after Fontana was active in Bologna, Giulio Mancini seems to have known the couple personally during their time living in Rome. Contrary to Malvasia's claims, he describes Zappi as a painter of language rather than brush, because he did not work but had good judgment and knew how to speak up, and in this way he helped his wife in her profession. Mancini's words suggest, more convincingly, that Zappi's role within the studio was to assist his wife in managing business matters, a job suited better not only to his gender, but also evidently to his skills. There's clear evidence to support this supposition. Surviving contracts executed by Zappi on his wife's behalf point to his involvement in important commissions, including this St. Hyacinth altarpiece for Santa Sabina in Rome, completed in 1599. Such assistance would have been invaluable to Lavinia, who, even as a married woman, could not legally engage in financial negotiations. So it seems that Gian Paolo acted as an intermediary in business, while Lavinia managed the creative and strategic elements of her workshop. Zappi's support as an intermediary may also have been useful in workshop supervision, allowing Lavinia, as mentioned, to work in separate spaces to the male artists in her employment. And indeed, their union seems to have proved advantageous to Lavinia, whose output increased rapidly following their marriage in 1577. Lavinia's studio hosted not only assistants and students, but also clients. Portraiture was the genre for which the artist was most famed, making up the bulk of her commissions. Both surviving portrait sketches and documentary evidence demonstrate that Lavinia worked from life in the creation of her portraits. In a letter dated 29th of October 1593 from Senator Camillo Pagliotti to Vincenzo Guerrio, a collector from Pistoia, uh, Pagliotti wrote that he begged that si Signore Mercale, this man here who he wanted a portrait of, 
would have patience one more time so that Lavinia would have some time to, to draw him. And now it's done because she has the already done the effigy and all that is lacking is the ornamentation of colour, which is almost complete. The naturalistic details offered through such direct observation are evident in many of Lavinia Fontana's portraits. See here, for example, the subtle shadow of the earring below Costanza Alidosi's earlobe and the manner in which her heavy velvet overgown folds at the waist, hiding part of her ornate gold cintola. In managing her workshop, Fontana had to contend not only with the legal and societal bar barriers never faced with by her male contemporaries, but also with physical ones. Between 1578 and 1595, she gave birth 11 times, meaning that the artist was pregnant for most of her professional life. <laughs> the physical toll of childbearing and labour undoubtedly impacted her workshop practice and required her to adjust her approach at certain moments of her career. Um, pregnancy was a dangerous condition in Renaissance Italy, where many women died during childbirth or of postpartum infection. But documents from the period suggest that Lavinia's responsibilities led her to return to her easel shortly after giving birth. A letter between two of Fontana's supporters, Carlo Segonio and Fulvio Orsini, dated 3rd of January 1579, related that Signora Lavinia gave birth to her son Orazio in the last month, and it is two days since she has been out of confinement. It seems that financial responsibilities to her family, therefore, led the artist to return to the workshop earlier than might have been typically recommended. The physical impediments to mobility brought about by pregnancy would have made it difficult, if not impossible, to address works on a very large scale. And indeed, most of Fontana's production during her childbearing years consisted of portraits and devotional paintings of small or medium size and format. Measuring Measuring signed and dated paintings against the information offered in the family's baptismal records that I'm showing you here, uh, suggests that the artist adapted the scale of her work according to her physical state, taking advantage of periods during which she was not heavily pregnant to address works on a larger scale. It may be for this reason that she, it took Fontana a year to deliver her first public commission, a votive altarpiece depicting the assumption of the Virgin for Imola's Palazzo Comunale, Fontana was contracted to paint the work in February of 1583, when she was around six months pregnant with her fifth child, but it was not delivered until the following year. The adaptability and versatility required of a woman managing a workshop during childbearing years was clearly far beyond that necessary for a male artist of the period. In the final years of the 1590s, when she was no longer having children, Lavinia produced more works on a larger scale. In 1599 alone, she completed three monumental and complex paintings, the visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon, the vision of St. Hyacinth and the consecration to the Virgin, all three of which you see here with dimensions. This supports the theory that the physical toll of pregnancy probably precluded her from undertaking such commissions in earlier years. Prospero's death in 1597 may, have, may also have afforded Fontana more autonomy to engage in ambitious and experimental projects. Even when Lavinia had full run of the family studio after her father retired, it was quite likely that she would have required additional space when painting such large scale works. The aforementioned consecration of the Virgin at almost three metres in height would almost certainly have proved impractical for their home studio. For such oversized works, Fontana may have rented external temporary working spaces in, in institutions like the Ospedale della Morte or in local patrician palaces, which was common practice among Bolognese artists by the early 1600s. The use of such private spaces, which served the additional function of keeping works in progress away from prying eyes, might explain the absence in contemporary records of one of the artist's most spectacular large scale compositions. I'm in no way biased by this, the, the visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon in the collection of the National Gallery of Ireland. A number of large scale works by Fontana present with technical characteristics or documentary evidence to suggest that they were created over a long period of time. While in earlier decades, this can be attributed to the physical impediments brought about by pregnancy, in her mature years, it might be more directly related to the structure and management of the artist's workshop. 
Scientific analysis of the structure of the paint layers of the visit of the Queen of Sheba to King Solomon, for example, revealed that the painting was created over, over a protracted period of time, in fact years we believe, with lengthy durations separating the application of successive layers of paint. Furthermore, as you can see here, there are pentimenti scattered across this composition, suggesting that it underwent at least three campaigns of major revision. So I'm just showing you one portion of the, the, the composition, and you can see here that the faces of the retinue of ladies that follow the Queen of Sheba have been painted out when brought to near completion and repositioned around 10 centimetres higher. Several factors are likely to have contributed to this. Based on the dates inscribed on many of her compositions, Fontana must have worked on several paintings in tandem at times. And in the presumed absence of a full-time team of studio assistants, she likely found herself overwhelmed by commissions during certain periods or awaiting input from contracted artists to assist with specific works. Her highly detailed rendering of fabrics must have also proved incredibly time consuming. And finally, the death of many of her children must have affected her rate of production. So seven of Fontana's children, uh, 11 children died prematurely. And later in her career, according to Mancini, the passing of her 14 year old daughter, Ledomia, left her completely devastated. To conclude then, the lack of contemporary documentation describing Lavinia's workshop practices means that we are limited in what we can draw upon in creating a picture of the artist's studio and its management. That being said, a renewed interest in early modern women artists has led to a series of high profile exhibitions and important publications celebrating the work of these groundbreaking figures. And furthermore, museums and galleries are turning their focus to the display and acquisition of artworks by women artists. These activities have led to the conservation and analysis of many of paintings by Lavinia Fontana and the data that such projects have generated is beginning to supplement our understanding of her working methods. It's my hope that Fontana's workshop practice and technique and that of the women artists that su succeeded her will form the focus of in-depth collaborative studies that in the not so distant future. In this way, we may depart from the concept of Lavinia Fontana as an artist once described and I quote, as prevailing beyond the conditions of her sex and refocus our image of an artist with prodig pr prodigious skill in painting. Thank you. Thank you, Aoife, for such detailed insight to a really unique case study for our conference. So last but not least um, on the schedule today, we have Michelle O'Malley. Um, now, we've already had an introduction, so I've promised I'll be brief. Um, but for the benefit of those joining us online, um, possibly in the room who weren't here earlier, Michelle O'Malley is Professor Emerita in Renaissance Art History at the University of London and the former Deputy Director of the Warburg Institute. Uh, in 2023, so earlier this year, and again in 2024, uh, she is and will be the scholar in residence uh, here at the NICI. Um, so welcome, Michelle, for your paper, Some Questions on Botticelli's Early Workshop Practice. Thank you, Lois. The questions I want to probe today concern how painters moved from the end of an apprenticeship to getting a business off the ground. Taking Botticelli as the model, unless, I want to look at early work to consider how he continued to develop after his training with Filippo Lippi, when and how he took on assistance, and how he managed the business. I will look particularly at infrared images of the underdrawings of some of Botticelli's paintings to examine Botticelli's production approaches. I will argue that the painter worked hard in the early years to improve and widen his basic skills, that he embraced new techniques and then managed production with striking pragmatism. Botticelli probably spent six or seven years in Filippino Lippi's workshop in Prato, likely returning to Florence in spring 1466 when he was about 21 years old. He set up a workshop in a room in his father's new house and began to produce Madonna and child images for direct sale. Many were inspired by the intensely beautiful Madonna and child paintings Filippo Lippi painted in the last decade of his career, which Botticelli probably saw being produced. 
the Munich and Palazzo Medici Madonnas and the Madonna and Child and Two Angels. The last is an especially inventive composition that actively involves the angels in the miracle of the Virgin's mystic marriage by lifting the child up for her adoration. Botticelli engaged with the Madonna and Child and Two Angels in his earliest works. Oops. A very early example now in Washington underlines how ambitious this project was. To replicate the concept of Lippi's composition required an understanding of the connections among four interacting figures, a capacity to depict weight and balance, and a grasp of the way form acts on the picture plane, regardless of where it appears in the perspectival representation of an image. Botticelli struggled with these elements, and the effort he devoted to mastering them is clear is clear in his, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. The effort he devoted to mastering them is clear in um, the pictures under drawing. It shows how much Botticelli still needed to understand about organizing multiple figures. Here, the problems stem from placing the figures too far apart. And so having to depict the child, not as presented by the angels. Now let's just get this right, yes. Um, but as passed to the Virgin. The child is implausibly supported. But the underdrawing, the detail here, highlights how intensely Botticelli labored to get this aspect right. Working and reworking the placement of the hands and also the draperies and the faces of the Virgin and the principal angel. He put the figures against a shell niche, but placed it too far up the picture plane to have the strong unifying force that Libby achieved with the shape in, for example, the Palazzo Medici Madonna. On the plus side, Botticelli's picture is well painted using Lippi's modeling technique of overlapping tones, and it depicts ex ex expressively grave figures that must have been intended to explore a different mood than did Lippi's joyful image. Botticelli made other attempts at this composition type that have an angel, that have an angel lifting the child. The painting in Ajaxia, for example, simplifies the idea and makes the action more convincing. Both of, these, both of these early pictures with their pensive angels and their inclusion of lengths of garland suggest that Botticelli was already looking beyond Lippi. In the late 1460s, one artist Botticelli certainly looked to and perhaps worked with was Andrea del Verrocchio, um, as were other artists whom we've heard about only a few minutes ago. Verrocchio was, at the same time, exploring his own painting skills. He was doing so, like Botticelli, by taking Lippi's late Madonna and child images as his models. Like Botticelli, he painted a version of the Madonna and child with angels. Another of Botticelli's versions of the composition underlines how closely Botticelli's connection with Verrocchio must have been. Both men also painted close adaptations of, of Lippi's Munich Madonna. And Botticelli continued his own Lippi-based work with the Madonna della Loggia, inspired by Lippi's Palazzo Medici Madonna. While it is unclear exactly how the association between Botticelli and Verrocchio operated, the several similar pictures suggest that Botticelli spent some time with Verrocchio. He is likely to have garnered more than examples of composition from the older artist. In the late 1460s, Verrocchio was already an accomplished sculptor and workshop manager. When he began painting, he transferred production practices between the media, and he tried new painting techniques. For example, Verrocchio involved several assistants in designing and painting a single work, using different media and types of transfer. Both practices challenged conventional methods. Verrocchio was also among the first painters to create cartoons for significant parts of panel pictures, a technique only developing in the late 1450s and 60s. 
Before that, artists made cartoons for transferring fresco designs, which required speed. For panels, cartoons were used only for areas of repeating decoration. But from at least 1470, Verrocchio designed cartoons for heads and faces, which we know through prick drawings, as you, and you're seeing one here, and sometimes for whole individual figures, which we know through underdrawings. Here, Tobias was transferred from a cartoon, but the other figure was not. The real trailblazer in this technique, however, was Neri de Bici, who employed cartoons to their full potential for repeating figure designs in different compositions. One example is his reusing the cartoons of the Virgin and St. Thomas in these altarpieces of the 1460s. In other cases, he flipped cartoons and traced figure outlines to create new figure characters, new figures and characters, as in these altarpieces. Such cartoon use was almost certainly new to Botticelli, who was trained by Lippi, a painter at the end of his career when cartoon innovations were introduced, and who was unlikely to embrace a technique for defining a panel's composition as he valued the opportunities that painting offered for last minute change. This makes it particularly significant that Botticelli used cartoons to make works in series from his earliest years as an independent painter. Cartoon use can be traced in two intriguing pairs of early works, the Virgin and Child with an Adoring Angel in Pasadena and Chicago, and the Virgin and Child with St. John in the Louvre and a private collection, which I've been generously allowed to show you today. This detail of the Chicago underdrawing shows the technique of cartoon use. It is these firm, smooth lines that make cartoon use clear. The lines differ dramatically from the fine, repetitive lines of freehand drawing that Botticelli used, for example, in the Chigi Madonna. I hope in this comparison, you can see the repeated lines in the Chigi Madonna and the very firm lines in the, um, in the Chicago underdrawing. These are the two different techniques. Botticelli may have conceived the series paintings to build up stock in tenderly inclined figures like those of the Madonna della Loggia. Intriguingly, the paintings of the Madonna and Child with St. John in the Louvre and a private collection also began with the Virgin's face in a three-quarter view. And I hope can you see here the, the cheek. Sorry, the cheek of the Madonna, her, no, her mouth, her nose, and her, her eyes, originally one way and then changed to a, to a purple. Cartoons were also certainly involved in these paintings, the paintings of the Madonna Child of St. John, um, because the individual figures of the, two, of the two panels align perfectly, just as they do in the Chicago and Pasadena pictures. The cartoon use is key for tracing workshop developments, but we don't know the dates of any of these four panels. The literature relies on style to date them variously from the mid 1460s to the mid 1480s, focusing especially on the questions of authorship. But the appearance of the new technique in these paintings is particularly significant and more pertinent to understanding their chronology in Botticelli's corpus is to assess why they were made and exactly how they were made, because these questions relate strongly to when they could have been made. The easiest to answer is why. Paintings were made in series because of demand. In Florence, clients rarely commission copies of paintings. Even contracts that stipulate similarity made it clear that new works were to differ from the models that are mentioned. This means that Botticelli's pairs were created for the direct sale market. Evidence of two different pairs of paintings suggests that Botticelli's business had meaningful demand for direct sale work. And demand can only have intensified when Botticelli began to receive commissions. In 1469 or 70, probably the Arte del Cambio commissioned the Virgin and Child in the Glory of Cherubim 
and the Madonna della Rosetta. At the same time, a private client ordered the two detailed little panels of the story of Judith and Holofernes, and someone, probably connected with the Medici, commissioned the Sant'Ambrogio altarpiece, which includes Saints Cosmos and Damien, the Medici saints. In 1470, the court of the Mercanzia commissioned the fortitude at the urging of Lorenzo de' Medici's uncle and advisor, Tommaso Sodorini. There were also undocumented commissions, such as, for example, the Chigi Madonna and the Adoration Tondo. All of these paintings are dated circa 1470. The requirements, deadlines, and prestige of these commissioned paintings, in addition to the pressure to create direct sale pictures, which Botticelli produced throughout his career, may well have brought a sense of urgency to Botticelli's business. That urgency was feasibly related to production technique as well as to sheer manufacturing volume. Sorry, that this urgency was connected to production technique as well as volume is suggested by two unrelated elements, the construction of the Sant'Ambrogio altarpiece and the nature of the assistance Botticelli eventually took on. Issues in Botticelli's production practices are highlighted by the recent technical analysis of the Sant'Ambrogio altarpiece. Its underdrawing is so dense that its conservators call it overabundant and chaotic. Its many changes and redrawings make it impossible to trace the exact steps taken in making the disegno. Worryingly, Botticelli ruled and incised the whole architectural setting before putting figures onto the panel. The scored architecture lines cut through the figures, and this is very unusual in Italian paintings. Then each figure went through numerous reconception. And I'm showing you just the child's head and legs with their dramatic orientations. So I hope you can see in red on, on the screen. The altarpiece emphasizes the fact that while Botticelli learned a great deal from Lippi, he must have had very little training in constructing a picture with multiple figures in a complicated setting. Fundamentally, this means that several years after setting up his own workshop, Botticelli was still working out production methods on the job. Botticelli's assistants also draw attention to questions of technique. Filippino Lippi started in 1470 or 1470, but sorry, started with uh, in 1470 or 1471 when his guardian placed him with Botticelli after his father's death. Filippino was only 13 in 1470, but he'd been trained by his father and already had a remarkable facility for design and painting. So remarkable that by 1473, he paid the level of fees to the Compagnia di San Luca that make it clear that he had proficiency in his craft. From around that date, he occasionally collaborated with Botticelli on paintings. But even more significantly, Botticelli deployed Filippino to design as well as paint images for direct sale. All Filipinos paintings made before the late 1470s, and these are a few, were produced from within Botticelli's workshop. The practice suggests that other tasks required Botticelli's personal attention. When Botticelli turned to the Florentine workforce to hire an apprentice, he employed Benedetto di Domenico d'Andrea, a painter exactly his own age, who already had six years of training with Neri de Bici. The choice implies that Botticelli wanted someone who could contribute to production immediately. While Benedetto can be securely dated in Botticelli's workshop only in mid-1472, he broke his contract with Neri on January 1st, 1470, and he probably therefore started with Botticelli very soon after that. We have no evidence of Benedetto's painterly skills, unlike Filippino, but Neri paid him 33 florins a year when the median pay for his assistance was seven to eight florins a year. Benedetto's talent must have contributed meaningful to production and income. 
He almost certainly had experience in creating and scaling cartoons as he was trained in the 1460s when Neri was accomplished at using cartoons to transfer figures among compositions, as we have seen. Benedetto could have instructed Botticelli in this practice. Certainly, Botticelli used cartoons for serial work as Neri used them to repeat figures and compositions. Moreover, there is probably evidence for assistance work in the precise practices of the Chicago and Pasadena paintings. In each panel, the cartoons were transferred and then moved and transferred again. The Virgin's limbs and features were shifted down, and these details show her repeated eyes and jaw lines. And I hope it's used to see them here. You can see eyes, nose started higher up, mouth higher up, jaw repeated. The child's head was rotated. Here is the higher eye in Chicago, and there are just vestiges of it here in the uh, Pasadena picture. A more dramatic change was the addition of an angel. I'm sorry, I always go the wrong way. Um, over what, where the right leg of the child originally stretched back onto the plinth behind the figures. Um, can you see just here this line that defines the leg? And then there are little toes down here on that. Once changes were made in one panel, they were repeated in the other. But they were not repeated exactly. The movements of the Virgin's face is particularly telling. In the Pasadena underdrawing, it was moved diagonal. It's moved. It's moved like that. But in Chicago, it was moved less sensitively straight down. Then the jawline had to be extended back to the ear creating a very wide cheek. Other modifications also suggest distinct sensibilities that imply different painters working on each panel. All this is to say that chances are high that Botticelli introduced a system of making cartoons for serial work after he hired Benedetto, which was after he began attracting commissions. These serial paintings I'm so sorry. These serial paintings, in conjunction with Filipino's pictures of the 1470s, suggest the high level of demand Botticelli's workshop enjoyed. They also demonstrate his management techniques for meeting demand. To sum up, Botticelli's earliest career was devoted to consolidating the skills he learned under Filippo Lippi and to gaining new abilities. He probably perceived that there were new methods for working that would aid his production. And this became especially important as he began to attract commissions. He chose assistants who could turn almost directly to production. And this is crucial to understanding how he built his business. We might say that like Raphael, he was not in the business of training people, he was in the business of hiring people who could work. He also learned from Filipino and Benedetto for in later years, he returned to these processes of production and management, giving assistants a level of agency that used their trained skills. Botticelli's early career suggests the talent, determination, and pragmatism he brought to transitioning from being an apprentice to being a master. It shows how he built a thriving business operation. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, so it falls to me to thank everyone very much for being here today um, and everyone online. Thank you to our organisers um, and our host and tech team um, here at the NICI. <laughs> it's gone very smoothly. Um, so um, we start again tomorrow in the morning at 9.30, I believe, um, with our second day of talks, half day of talks. So we hope to see you all here again then.